now to Psalm 1, which we looked at two weeks ago. We looked at blessing in Psalm 1, and today we're going to look at curses in Psalm 1. I'll read the whole of Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or the path, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. And all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for it. Will you pray with me before I begin to preach? Most gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart on this passage of Scripture would be acceptable in your sight. And we pray that you would teach us all. Unite us by your Holy Spirit to understand your word. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Two weeks ago, we considered what it means to be blessed by the Lord. We learned that knowing God by his word gives us direction, it gives us purpose in life. God's word is a blessing because it tells us what we were made for. We have a target, we have a purpose, we have a destination. We understand why we're here. And that is a great blessing. And it's only by the word of the God that we understand these things. Our ultimate purpose. And this week we're going to meditate upon the opposite side of the coin. What a downer. For my second candidating sermon, you're thinking, right? It's great to look at blessings. It's not so great to think about curses. We're going to consider what it means to go about with no firm knowledge of who God is and what we are made for. Friends, this is the essence of what it means to be cursed in this fallen world. To go about with any purpose, to go about without any direction, to go about without any knowledge of why we're here, where we're headed, what's going on, why it happens the way that it happens, why we experience pain and loss. This is the essence of what it means to experience curse. So let's meditate upon Psalm 1 and what it teaches us about being cursed. Because it's, it's good to know what we're in for if we decide to turn away from the living God. First, in Psalm 1, notice the imagery used to describe these purposeless people, the cursed in this psalm. There is no anchor for them. There is nothing to root them during the storms of life. And these storms, as we all know regularly, come in this sinful world, don't they? We have friends who become ill, or family members who become ill suddenly and even pass away. Our marriages go sideways. We are at odds with people. We have a a demanding boss who doesn't like us very much and makes life miserable at work. We lose our jobs. We understand that the storms of life will come, don't we? The cursed in this psalm, the psalmist tells us, are like chaff blown away by the wind. One direction, then another, by these kinds of storms. When the storms come, they have no anchor, no solid ground to stand upon, no purpose, no direction. Now, this this demands some explanation, right? I don't want to talk in stereotypes here about those who are outside of the will of God. That wouldn't be fair. It's one thing to say that those who forsake God's word and his purposes will experience frustration and meaninglessness. It is 
something that I can say, but I want to back it up. I want us to think about this. Is that the kind of people we actually encounter outside of the church? I know a number of people who are non-Christians who have great purposes in their lives, who are very driven. And guess what? You do too. You know those who have forsaken the word of God, who have walked out of the church, who don't want anything to do with God, who seem to live with great purpose. But that's not really the question here. That's not what the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 1. The real question is whether they will ultimately find that purpose and meaning fulfilled in the end. Whatever the little gods are that they're worshiping, whatever their purposes are in life, outside of the word of God, outside of the will of God, will it ultimately satisfy them? That's the question here that the psalmist is really asking. And I believe, friends, when we listen carefully to their voices, to the voices of those who are outside of the church, that what we find is that they indeed are dissatisfied. They're indeed blown here and there for every storm of life that comes along. People outside of the will of God are searching in this world for real purpose. Real, ultimate meaning in their lives. Let me give you some examples, some proof, if you will, from those who are looking for meaning apart from the Lord. Let's hear them in their own voices. Many of you will know who Tom Brady is. Uh, Whether you like it or not, and many of you are probably Chiefs fans, so you don't like it a whole lot at all, pretty soon Tom Brady will retire and he will be considered the GOAT. Greatest of all time. He will be a shoe-in for the Hall of Fame in the NFL. Uh, He will be certain to be considered perhaps the greatest single player to ever play the game of professional football. He is a five-time Super Bowl MVP, a seven-time Super Bowl champion, a three-time NFL MVP. And most of us here and outside of the church would say that's a pretty darn successful life. He's famous, he's rich, Uh, he seems to have everything going for him. Nonetheless, after winning his third Super Bowl title, which is only one less than anybody had ever won, any single quarterback had ever won, Brady confessed that he still hadn't found peace, that he still wasn't satisfied with all he had. This is what he said in an interview with 60 Minutes. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think God. It's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. The interviewer asks him, what's the answer then? Tom Brady responds, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. All that success, all those accomplishments, all that fame, and yet no real sense of peace, no real sense of satisfaction. There's the story of Paul Gauguin, the post-impressionist painter who left France looking for a world untouched by the modern civilization he was a part of in France. And he traveled around the world to Tahiti looking for this Edenic place, this place where he could finally be satisfied, a place untouched by the taint of the modern man, the modern scientific world, somewhere he could go back to perhaps what he imagined Adam and Eve would have experienced. But when he got there to Tahiti, he was saddened. He found that it indeed too had been touched by the outside world. Gauguin has a masterpiece hanging in the the Nelson Atkins Museum, which sums up his despair. It's called Fatuama, which is a Tahitian word, and the Tahitian word means melancholic 
or brooding. You can see the painting up there right now. The subject is a beautiful Tahitian woman. And we might not think much about it. But she's being portrayed in the confines of Western civilization. Her gown and her chair symbolize the modern taint of her Edenic or natural pre-modern civilization, the one that Gauguin thought would bring him happiness if he could just enter back into it. This is a very sad painting for him. This is a lament for him. He had literally traveled across the globe to find his purpose, and yet in the end he does not and cannot realize his dreams of entering into some Eden here in this life and being truly happy, truly satisfied, truly at peace. I could go on and on. I could give you example after example after example. All of us experience the death of our little idols in this lifetime, the things by which we attempt to find happiness, purpose, and meaning, the things that are not God, They always disappoint in the end, whether relationships or academics or financial successes. We strive after them, and then we might obtain them if we're really lucky, right? We we grasp them, and then we find they're just not what we thought they would be. I could go on and on. The secular writer and academic, David Foster Wallace, who himself came to the end in despair... This is not a Christian voice. This is what he says about running after these things. I really believe this is a common grace expression from David Foster Wallace. Listen to these words. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power. You will end up feeling weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. You know what he suggests? This is a commencement address to Kenyon College in 2013. You know what he suggests? The only thing, even though he doesn't believe it, in life that you can grasp onto that will actually give you some joy and not end in despair? God. He's not a believer. But he recognizes that somehow God is the one thing that will not disappoint. Amazing words from a secular writer. It's a curse, friends, to live running after these little idols. It is a curse. It is a curse to attempt to be God or to try to make someone else or something else God or a savior in your life other than Jesus Christ. I truly believe that. In the end, you will find no peace, no stability when the storms of life come upon you. You will be like chaff blown in this direction and then that direction, never finding an anchor. One more thing, though, as we close, I want you to pay attention to here. In this psalm, when we talk about the curses, consider a second detail about the cursed, just for a moment. The psalmist tells us that they won't stand in unity with the congregation of blessing. They won't stand with the people of God. And this is a scary and harsh word. And sometimes we, I think, understand it only at least half of it. We think, oh, oh, this is that whole doctrine that we talk about in the Bible, which the Bible does talk about, called hell. They won't stand with the blessed in the end. They'll be sent away. But friends, that's only understanding part of what's being said here. They won't stand in the end with the congregation of the righteous, the people of God, not only because they're not allowed to, but because they won't want to in the end. And I say that not because I'm making that up. I say that because that's what the Bible displays for us. That's what the Bible actually shows us 
in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, in the 16th chapter of that book, the Apostle John, when he's seeing his great vision of the end, sees God pouring out the beginnings of his wrath on people, but with a very specific purpose. The purpose being that they would feel what it will be like to be under his wrath and then turn to him for mercy and grace and love and justice and eternity. And yet what John sees in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation is that at every point, instead of turning to God and calling out for him to be saved, the people harden their hearts to God gnash their teeth at God, and refuse to repent. You see, not only will they not be allowed to, they won't want to be in the presence of God. That, I believe, is what chapter 16 shows us in the book of Revelation, that not once, not twice, but three times, the people harden their hearts to God and shake their fists at God and say, I don't want anything to do with you, God. There's a curse which we are warned about in Scripture. Not just people outside the church, but people inside the church as well. And the curse is about having a hard heart. Hardening our hearts to God, because it is a dangerous thing when we harden our hearts to the living God. Like Jonah did. It's a dangerous thing because in the end we might find ourselves not wanting anything to do with him even when there is no hope without him. And friends, there is no hope without him. This is why Jesus Christ is such good news. Because he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the hope that we have. Through faith in him, we are promised not a future of pain and sorrow and curse, but a great future of blessing and joy. Amen. Let me close with these words from the author of Hebrews, who encourages those in the church to be careful about hardening their hearts. The author says this, Therefore take care, brothers and sisters, that none of you may have an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but exhort one another, church, exhort one another, every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partners of Christ, if only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. Amen. Will you pray with me now? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel of your love. We thank you for your mercy, which is most purely and beautifully exhibited on the cross of Jesus Christ, where he stood under your wrath for us. And through faith in Jesus Christ, we no longer stand under the curse, but we stand under your blessing for all eternity. That is what we look forward to. And we pray that we would not take lightly the words of the author of Hebrews and that we would encourage one another daily to continue to follow after Jesus Christ faithfully, to listen to your word, even when it says things that we don't like, and to pursue your paths as you set them out before us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.